Hello, and welcome to the new ARC Racing Tech Videos. My name is Jody, I am the engine builder here at ARC Racing, and I'm also one of the techs that you talk to whenever you call in on our 800 or tech line. Now the purpose of these videos that we're doing is to do nothing more than to show you the ways that we recommend you use the products that we manufacture here at ARC Racing, and to give you a couple of how-to tips on the products to ensure that you're getting the full benefit from them. Now in this first video, what we're going to do is to show you step by step the ways that we recommend that you install, time, torque, and remove an ARC billet flywheel. This would be the same procedure used on a Honda, Clone, Predator, Briggs, Kawasaki, Subaru, whichever engine that we manufacture a flywheel for, you would use this same basic procedure in installing it and removing it. So, let's get going. Before we get started, I need to point out that we have made some changes to this flywheel over the past couple of years. One being, we added the puller holes in 2013. But the biggest change happened in 2014 when we added 8 degrees timing advance to the keyway. Meaning that this flywheel on your engine with a stock key will give you 32 degrees timing. Now this is important to know because all the flywheels made prior to 2014 were at the old standard 24 degrees with a stock key. There's two ways to tell which flywheel you have. One being the date code. The date code will be located right beside the part number. This is a 6619 for a Honda or clone engine. The first number is the month. The second number is the year. If this number is 14 or 15, then you have a 32 degree flywheel. If it's prior to that, then it's at the old 24 degrees. Another way to tell is that we engraved 32 degrees timing advance into the body of all the 2014 and the 2015 model flywheels for the Honda, Clone, or Predator engines. All right, what I'm going to show you now is how to check where the coil is firing at on your flywheel with a timing light. Um, this is rather important because if you're setting your timing off a degree wheel with a dial indicator, you'll need to know exactly where the coil is firing in reference to the magnet. Now, all ARC flywheels are designed originally to fire when the leading edge of the magnet, as the engine turns, which is right here, the first line you see i got it painted yellow usually it'll be gray like this right here but the first line as the engine is rotating is in line with the right hand edge of the coil uh, they was this is the way it was originally designed and intended to be used however with these coils being of course chinese made every once in a while you'll find one that's a little more or a little less some will fire here some may fire there but originally designed to fire right here and what you can do is use any standard timing light as you see i'm using one it's a sears and roebuck timing light it's probably older than i am but um any timing light will do uh, just hook it up to the coil wire it needs to have a plug in it to work properly make sure everything is out of the way um, you can spin the engine with a electric starter you can spin it with an electric engine stand like what we got here. Uh, this is set up, runs off a pulley system. It runs at about 1950, 2000 RPMs, which is about where you need to be to make sure that everything is firing where it needs to. Uh, run off a standard battery, and I usually put a battery charger on mine just to make sure it's got enough juice. Now with these timing lights, it's according to what model it is. Some of them will only work in one direction. If you hook it up and you got good battery, you got good power source, the engine spinning, the RPMs it needs to, and you see that it's not working, just take the little clamp and turn it the other way. Because they only, some of them are only made to read digital, and these older, what I call analog type systems, you have to turn this the opposite way for it to read. So if it don't read, just flip that over, and 99% of the time they'll work. All right. Like I say, I'm going to turn it on and show you 
where the coil is supposed to fire in reference to the magnet because this is where you set the timing when you are setting it with the degree wheel indicator which I'll show you here in just a minute. You want to point the light directly at the coil. See it firing? It's firing right where it's supposed to, right dead on the leading edge of the magnet with the right hand edge of the coil. That's perfect. That is your timing mark for when you set your timing. Alright, as we stated, what we're doing here is simply showing you how to properly install the 6619 billet flywheel on this box stock project engine. First thing you want to do, of course, is take out the flywheel key because we're going to show you the lapping process right here. We get a lot of phone calls about how do you lap the flywheel, what is it, what does it consist of, well, we're fixing to show you. The easiest way i found to get these keys out is with a standard set of just regular old everyday side cutters. You can take it in there, it grips the key very well, and just pry it right up. Set the key somewhere where you can find it because you're gonna need it later. All right, lapping the flywheel is nothing more than using some type of compound on the tapers to grind away any imperfections there may be in the uh, machining process between the two tapers. So they made up nice and properly and stay torqued like they need to. Standard valve grinding compound is what we use. Uh, you don't have to use a very heavy grit. You can use, you know, most any medium grit, 220, 280. I wouldn't use nothing no finer than a 300. Uh, simply just take it, put it on the taper, take your flywheel, put the flywheel on the taper, push in, and rotate it back and forth. And what this is doing it is removing, as I said, the imperfections between the taper of the flywheel and the taper of the crankshaft, making sure that it mates up and torques down properly and doesn't give you any problems with spinning. This is a very simple process. You just need to make sure that you're pushing in equally and turning and it's not wobbling back and forth, that you're getting good even pressure and stop and rotate it, you know, every so many revolutions. You can hear the grit inside there grinding away those imperfections of any that they may be. Not saying that there are any, but just in case. You want to make sure that this, the two tapers are smooth as possible. This may take a little longer than what I'm going to do it here, but time reasons, we're just going to take it off and now I'll show you how to clean it up. As you see, inside here, inside the keyway, you get a lot of material, a lot of the grit, a lot of the grime. Take your Q-tip, rag, whatever. Make sure that is very, very, very clean. Another very important thing is to make sure that it does not wind up inside the engine because this is a grinding compound. It will destroy your engine in a matter of seconds. I like using just standard carburetor cleaner right in the aerosol can spray it on it gets this stuff off really 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 good um, use it on a rag wipe it off same thing with the flywheel you got to get everything out get it cleaned up really good inside the keyway slots again carburetor cleaner parts washer I always finish up with standard soap and water and a little brush and just to make sure I got everything good and clean. Uh, and then once you get done with that, take you a standard towel, paper towel, whatever, and wipe in there and make sure that nothing comes out. Because if anything comes off on the rag, you need to clean it again and clean it again and clean it again until there's nothing coming off on this rag. Because any grit, any material left inside this taper will not allow it to lock down like it needs to. All right, now we've got everything cleaned up. Got the crankshaft clean, got the keyway slot cleaned out. 
we got the flywheel clean. Use our carb cleaner and soap and water to uh, get everything good and clean like it needs to be. All right, look inside here on the flywheel and you'll see two distinct colors. You'll see the old original shiny part and the new part that we lapped in. This is the area right here that is in contact with the taper on the crankshaft. This is the area that mates up that holds the flywheel straight. And by lapping in, what we've done is remove any possibilities of machine imperfections between the aluminum flywheel and the cast iron crankshaft. This will give a good, good mating seat and this flywheel here should stay in place like it needs to. Now, I'm gonna show you how to put the key back in properly because these keys are probably the reason for seven if not eight out of 10 flywheel slips. Most of them are put in incorrectly. There is a right way and a wrong way to put these in. I'm gonna show you both. First thing I like to do is take just a standard file and just you know, run the key over it several times to make sure that there's not any edges or burrs or, you know, this area, you know, right here where we use to the side cutters to get it out with. You know, take any burrs off of it, make sure it's good and flat, good and smooth, and uh, it should go right in with no problem. Now, installing the key is simple. What you want to do, you want to make sure that the key, when it goes into the crankshaft, is parallel with the actual shaft and not the taper. The taper runs up and down, the shaft runs this way. So you want the key, the side closest to the engine, which is this side, to be in the shaft, and the side closest to the threads to be sticking up a little bit. And the easiest way to get the key down into the shaft is with a simple rubber mallet. Just make sure everything's lined up good, make sure your key is deburred, and she should slide right in, no problem. That right there is the proper way the key should be in. Engine side should be down in the shaft. Thread side should be sticking up. All right, a lot of times people put them in like that. With that side sticking up. What this is gonna do, this is gonna, in most cases, hinder the flywheel from mating up properly with the taper of the crankshaft. It's not gonna push up there like it needs to, so therefore the two tapers are not gonna mate up and they're not gonna lock down like they need to. It's gonna rest on this and it's gonna eventually make the flywheel spin. So the key, for those of you who use keys, engine side should be in, thread side should be up. That way when the flywheel goes on, It goes up all the way like it should. All right, we've got our flywheel and crankshaft lapped in. We've got it cleaned up. We've got the surfaces ready to be torqued down. These two surfaces should be made up, torqued down nice and tight. Um, should be good to go. Right, I showed you how to install the key properly with the you know, side close to the engine down, close to the threads up, so that the flywheel and all can mate up properly. Now I'm going to show you how to install and time it without a key. Because personally, I don't run keys. I never really have. The only time I've run keys is in series that, in the rule book, says it had to be done. Um, the only job of a key is to line up the flywheel on the crankshaft, hold it in place while it's being torqued down. Once it's torqued, the two tapers from the crankshaft to the flywheel squeeze together, creates a bond, and it holds it in place. The key after that is just dead weight. All right, so all we're gonna to need to do this, of course, is a dial indicator, dial indicator bracket, mounted to the top of the engine. It don't really matter how it's mounted, as long as it's good, secure, and solid, and gives you a fairly close to center point on your indicator. You don't wanna be very top and very bottom because the piston itself can rock you want to be as close to center as you can get. Um, that way you get a good accurate reading. Uh, degree wheel, uh, these can be purchased at any, any cart shop. Uh, most everybody's got them. Uh, and you always want to check the timing on the PTO side, not the flywheel side. Um, right here, this is nothing more than a throttle shaft that I've, I mean, a throttle return spring rod that I've bent 
and uh, bolted to the side of the engine. You just need something to point that's you know fairly stable. It don't just sit there and flop. Uh, simple tool, simple procedure. All right, what I usually do is zero everything out first. Get you a dial indicator, find top dead center, rotate it back and forth several times to make sure that you're right where you need to be. Once you find it, zero out your degree wheel. I've already got this zeroed out, ready to go. All right, then I, basically I just kind of rotate the engine up so I can see the uh, key slot. And I try my best just to kind of eyeball it and line it up with that key slot so I know I'm kind of halfway where I need to be. Put my cup on, take the nut, and you don't want to, you know, really tighten it. You just want it to touch. Back it off a little bit so that you can still turn the flywheel without turning the engine. All right. Make sure everything's still zeroed out. Looks good there. And we're zeroed there. All right, now, as I showed you in the last segment, what you're looking for is the leading edge of the magnet lined up with the right-hand edge of the coil. Leading edge, of course, is the first gray line as the engine rotates. I got this one yellow so you can see it, but normally they look like this. They're gray. The first gray line as the engine rotates lines up with the right-hand edge of the coil. It ain't got to be precise, just as long as it's you know, on the edge, kind of in the middle of it, that's fine. Just as long as you're in this vicinity of that line is, is, is good. All right. Everything's still zeroed out. What we do is we rotate the engine backwards, the opposite way that it runs, to whatever desired degree you want. I like to start with 34 on most engines. Most of them I leave in that area, but... Some of them like a little more, a little less, but I usually start with 34. All right, so we've got our pointer on 34. We take our flywheel. Since it's not locked down, you can still spin it. Hold the crankshaft. Rotate it up. Leading edge of the magnet, right-hand edge of the coil. And just kind of, you know, touch the bolt so that it holds. All right, recheck. We're still at 34. On the leading edge and usually what I do is take a little small impact gun with a socket and just hit it. What that does, that doesn't torque it down, that just pushes the flywheel up just enough so that you can turn the engine by using the flywheel. Recheck our zero. Top dead center. And we're zeroed there. All right, now we just take the flywheel, we rotate it back, leading edge of the magnet, right hand edge of the coil leg, and we're dead on 34, right where we need to be. All right, sometimes you have to do it a time or two, which is why I don't torque it down to begin with. I just kind of hit it with this, and it gets the flywheel on there good enough to where it holds where you can spin the engine, because sometimes you know, the flywheel will move one way or the other, and you'll be a degree off, half a degree off. If you're as angle about it as I am, I want it dead on 34, dead on the leading edge. I, I'm, I'm kind of ticky about that. And that way, if you're off a little bit, you can simply take the nut off, use a rubber mallet, and you should just be able to pull it off with your hand. Comes right off. No problem. All right. Now, what I'm going to show you is how to torque it down once you find your setting where you want it. And if it's where it needs to be, exactly on 34, 36, 32, whatever you're using, show you how to properly torque the flywheel down so that it stays in place with or without a key. Okay. Now we're going to show you the proper way to torque down your ARC billet flywheel. Because like I said before, the torquing process is probably one of, if not the most important part of putting your flywheel on. Because an under torque flywheel is almost guaranteed to slip. However, an over torque flywheel can be a problem also because with it being over torqued, 
if you have to move the timing or later on during a rebuild, the flywheel may be difficult to get off. Um, once I show you the torque procedure, I'm going to show you the ways that we recommend, the different ways that you can remove a flywheel. All right, the first thing you're going to need when torquing your flywheel is some way to make sure the crankshaft is held in place. Uh, this is something, a little makeshift that actually Hunter come up with. It's a back plate for a torque converter for a junior drag engine. Um, it's, it does the job we need it to do. It fits the crankshaft. It's got a keyway in it. We drilled a hole to lock it to the side cover. Holds the crankshaft in place like it needs to be so you can get proper torque. Now, there's many ways you can do this. Um, you can take an old Noram clutch, uh, take the guts out of it, use the hub to put on here to put a pipe wrench or channel locks or something on to hold. Um, anything you can use to put on the crankshaft that fits it, that's got a key uh, that can either be locked to the side cover or held with a pipe wrench will work. I don't recommend putting the pipe wrench directly on the crankshaft because it can do two things. It'll leave teeth marks in it where it grips, which of course later on will have to be filed down or sanded so the clutch can go on and off properly. Another thing it will do is get in here in these key slots and chip it out, which is a very bad thing because when you go to put the clutch on, the key will have a hard time lining up and getting in there right and cause a lot of problems. So like I said, anything you can use to fit on the crankshaft that's got a key that can be clamped to or drilled in and locked to the side cover will work. Now this engine has already been timed with our degree wheel and dial indicator off of our firing line and we've hit it with the impact gun to just get it started so that it stays in place while you're torquing it. We highly recommend using a torque wrench when doing this. A lot of people use air guns and things like that and most of them over torque them and have a hard time getting them off. A torque wrench is the proper way to put this on here. And for all of our non-adjustable and adjustable flywheels, we recommend a minimum of 65 foot-pounds. That's foot-pounds, not inch-pounds. Um, this is true with pretty much every flywheel we got with the exception of the 6602 ultralight flywheel. With this flywheel being so light and with the center section with a little flex in it, we recommend a minimum of 55 foot-pounds. I don't recommend using too much more than this because it will make it difficult to get off. And with it being so light, that, that's all the torque you need. Now some people actually use a little more than 65 foot-pounds on these flywheels. That's fine if it you know, helps you feel better about the flywheel being on. It's not really going to hurt nothing. It may hinder something later on when you're trying to take it off, but 65 foot-pounds is the minimum. Okay. It's also recommended that you use an actual foot-pounds torque wrench. That way you got plenty of length to get the torque that you need and you're not straining and struggling and with awkward positions trying to get it right. I've already got our set at 65 foot-pounds. We've got our crankshaft locked down where it needs to be. We put it on and listen for the click. I usually hit it another time or two just to make sure we're where we need to be. All right, that flywheel there has been lapped, has been timed, and has been torqued down the way that we at ARC Racing recommend this product be used. One thing you may notice when you put on this flywheel for the first time, it's according to what block you're using. This is a box stock project block. Uh, just the same with the Harbor Freights, the Predators, uh, whichever. Not all the blocks are casted the same where the coil mounts up. Every once in a while, you'll get one, and this flywheel has already been properly torqued, that is close to the magnet edge. As long as the magnet itself is showing on both sides, everything is fine. Um, if you get one to where some of the coil is hanging over into the aluminum, uh, there's no problem with putting spacers behind it, just a standard flat washer. I use them quite often just to kind of get the coil a little more centered up. But like I say, that right there is fine. As long as the magnet itself is completely under the coil, you're fine. And this don't happen with all engines. This is one or two out of 20. 
Um, it's just a, a casting flaw that happens with some of the engines and there's no problem whatsoever with putting washers behind it to move them out. That way you're getting a proper charge and proper fire. Okay, now I'm going to show you how to set the coil gap when using an ARC billet flywheel. The coil gap is nothing but the airspace that's in between the bottom of the coil and the top of the magnet. All of our ARC flywheels come with a slip of paper telling you that we recommend a minimum coil gap of 30 thousandths. That's the minimum. That's as close as we recommend you run the coil to the magnet. That's done for several reasons. Uh, one reason is if you get it any closer than 30 thousandths because of crankshaft flex, when this engine's running, the crankshaft is, is flexing up and down and going in several different directions and there's a possibility that the magnet could come in contact with the coil. And if that ever happens, as soon as it hits, it's going to short the coil out, it's going to burn it up, and the engine usually dies right there. Um, another reason that we recommend a minimum of 30 thousandths is because the magnets in our flywheels are so strong that any closer than 30, and it's putting consistent power through this coil, really, it's really a little more than it can handle and any closer than 30 thousandths could put too much through it, get the coil hot, and could eventually burn it up. It's not an instantaneous thing. It happens over a number of cycles and slowly burns up and could cause lots of problems with your engine. Now setting the coil gap is a very, very simple process. Um, it can be done with you know simple feeler gauges, which is I recommend feeler gauges because they're metal and they stick to the magnet. And I'm going to show you why here in just a second. The first thing I do when setting the coil gap, I loosen the coil, move it all the way to the top, as high as it'll go, and just kind of touch it back down. Rotate the engine so the magnet is directly under the coil. It ain't got to be perfect, but it needs to be fairly centered. All right, take your feeler gauge of whatever thickness. Um, of 30 thousandths or thicker. Put it on top of the magnet. Just like that. And then when you loosen the coil bolts up, the magnet does its job and pulls it right down there to it. And holds it in place on the feeler gauge at proper thickness. Then you just kind of tighten her back up. Now the torque on this is uh, many people debate this. I just make sure they're tight. Don't try to wring them off, but just make sure they're good and tight. Just that simple. Now rotate around. Feeler gauge comes out. Coil gap is set and it's even at both sides. Now that we've shown you how to install, time, and properly torque down your ARC billet flywheel, I want to show you a couple of ways that we recommend that you remove the flywheel. Uh, flywheel removal is a heavily debated topic in the engine world as to what exactly is the proper way to remove one. Well, a couple of different ways you can do it. One is the old tried and true hammer pry bar technique. This technique has been used for decades and is probably still one of the most widely used ways to remove a flywheel. Um, it's a couple different ways you could do it. Uh, simply start off by removing the nut and the cup. Set the cup to the side because you'll be using the standard nut that come with the engine. One thing you want to make sure of is to line up the nut and the end of the crankshaft as flush as possible. If the nut's in too far and the crankshaft exposed, you could hit it with the hammer, flare it out, and it could cause thread damage. Same thing with the nut. If the nut is out too far, you could hit it with the hammer, flare it out, and it could cause thread damage to the nut and the crankshaft. So the crank and the nut should be lined up as flush as possible. Simply take your pry bar, put it in behind the flywheel. It helps now to have a another person here with you to help hold the engine or you could bolt it to the table. Either way works fine because you're going to have to pry out on the flywheel. Making sure that our nut 
crankshafts are lined up good, you just take your hammer, swift, solid impacts to the center of the crankshaft. Usually two, three, four impacts and the flywheel should come right off. Now, another way I like to do this is by using some type of knocker on the flywheel. This is nothing more than a 6436 starter nut that we manufacture for the clone and predator engines. I like using this because it protects the end of the crankshaft from impact. Um, you'll want to run it all the way in and back it off just a little bit so that you see a little space in between the nut and the flywheel. It's the same procedure. Pry wall behind the flywheel. Swift center impacts with the hammer. This type of flywheel knocker or starter nut will virtually eliminate any possibilities to crankshaft damage on the end. Now we hear all the time and you read on the internet of people saying that they don't want to hit their racing engine with a hammer or take a hammer to their engine, whatever. And that's, that's fine and it's fully understandable. Um, so what we've done here at ARC Racing, as I showed you before, in 2013, we incorporated the puller holes to use with our puller system. Now, I honestly believe that this is the best puller system on the market. Um, it works with all of our non-adjustable billet flywheels, as well as our adjustable flywheels and big block flywheels. It also works with, I believe, most every other flywheel on the market that has a puller hole system already in it. It's a simple, simple tool. First thing is make sure that all the thread holes are clean on the flywheel. You blow them out with the air hose or whatever. I make sure the threads are clean on the, the bolts. Simply run them in. You want to run them all the way in until they bottom out. Push the block up to the crankshaft. Run the bolts up. And I use a standard impact gun with a deep well half inch socket. Now, this works really good. You don't have to go real crazy with it. Just a couple of hits on each side and it pulls it right off. Just like that. Now, I hope this video has been helpful to you. Um, if you have any other questions or concerns, feel free to give us a call on our 800 number at 800-521-3560 or you can contact us through Facebook.